welcome to church today. My name is Mackenzie. This is Drew and the rest of the team. And whether you are here in the room or you're watching online, we're so glad that you're here. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. And our hope and prayer for this place is that it would be a place where you feel like you can come just as you are, where you are seen and you are loved. We're gonna start our time with some singing and worship and we do this to praise Jesus for who he is and for all that he is doing in our lives. So if I can invite you all to stand to your feet, the words will be on the screen, so feel free to join in and sing with us when you're ready. Here we go.
you here today. God, just acknowledge the simple truth that every breath, every moment on this earth is a gift from you. We thank you for the life that you have given each and every one of us. God, that you are for us, that you are not against us, that you have a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us, and that you loved us so much that you sent your son pay the ultimate price on our behalf. Just God, we just thank you for the many ways that you love each and every one of us. And God, I pray that you would do what only you can do, that you'd open our hearts, God, you'd open our minds, you'd speak to us here today, you'd help us take a step closer towards you and to knowing you better. So we pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. It was great to sing with all of you. You can go ahead and take a seat. 
Hey, what's up everyone? Thanks for joining us for Eagle Brook Online. To be honest, I have spent a pretty decent amount of time thinking about last week's message. Jason shared some vision about where we believe God is leading our church, our Maplewood campus launching this weekend, and our Rochester campus buying land so we can build a permanent home. It is super exciting. But maybe the skeptic in you thinks, well, I don't live anywhere near Maplewood or Rochester, and as an online attender, why would I get excited about that? To be clear, I'm in the same boat as you. Rochester is hours away from my house, but the reason that I'm excited is because the mission of our church is to reach people who are far from God. So every time we open up a campus, no matter where it is, we reach more people. We're not celebrating a building. The building is just the tool that we use to move the mission of our church forward. And the same goes for our online campus, and there has been a lot of exciting things happening here as well. This summer and fall, we have had a major pop in new viewing groups, people who are gathering in local places to watch Eagle Brook Online together. We've started groups in Mankato and Cook, Melrose, Hancock, Ely, and Baxter, Minnesota, as well as Eau Claire, Wisconsin. We have another 10 or so groups in the works right now, and another seven groups that are meeting in jails and prisons. And we have also had an uptick in churches showing our messages on the weekends. If I had to summarize from a high level how these groups got started, most of them started with a small group of people, like a family or two, and then they'd reach out to us and ask questions about what it would look like for them to start a group in their community. They go through the process and they get their group started, typically not having any idea who's actually gonna show up. And then they start inviting people that they know and the group continues to grow. And for example, a group of moms in Hancock, Minnesota did this. They were planning to meet at a local event center, and since their launch, they've regularly had over 40 people attending, 40. I didn't even know 40 people lived in Hancock, Minnesota. It is just a small town of about 850 people, nearly three hours from our nearest campus, and they have a thriving viewing group. A group that isn't just connecting to a message on the weekend, but is experiencing community because of Eagle Brook Online. And if they can do it, so can you. If you wanna start a group in your area, you can reach out to us and we can talk you through what it might look like. Just head over to eaglebrookchurch.com and click on the viewing group tile. And with that, we're kicking off a new series today. Ryan has the message. Enjoy the rest of the service. Welcome to Eagle Brook Church. We are so glad that you decided to turn on church, come to church this weekend before Thanksgiving. If you're in town visiting family, thank you for being part of ours for an hour. And can I just say a special welcome for the very first time as they launch this weekend, our Maplewood location. Uh, Maplewood, we are so excited for you. We see you, we love you, and we are excited that you are officially the 12th location for Eagle Brook Church. Now, we are kicking off a brand new series today called Burn the Ships, looking at some of the things in our lives that we indeed need to let go of. Now, the older I get, the more amazed I am at the things that you and I just aren't willing to let go of. For example, in my house, single socks. Now, here's the deal. I don't know why we hold on to hope that 27 socks that lost their partners in transit from our bedrooms to the dryer will one day be found, but nevertheless, I'm just like, just in case they return, we hold on to them. Uh, another thing in our house that we hold on to is Tupperware lids. I don't know why 
We think we have this strategy like to hold on to lids that fit no containers in our home. Sometimes we just grab a lid in a container and just pray that, it, that it, they're going to work together. Uh, chargers, uh, some that work, some that used to. Are we praying for resurrection life to hit the charger and bring it back? I, I don't know. Uh, old t-shirts. We got some dingy t-shirts that we keep just in case we have to paint a room or help a friend move, which I get. What I don't understand is why we keep eight of those in the closet. Um, condiment packets. You got Chick-fil-A ketchup packets from 2009 in a junk drawer. Uh, some people hold on to expired coupons. Hope like the, the thought that they could have got the deal just stays with them for some odd reason. Uh, buttons. You know those extra buttons that come with new clothing? You've never sewn one on in your life, but you're ready, so... That's great. Uh, I mean, whether it's old glasses, free pens from conferences, or trophies from the third grade, or DVDs, it's like we all have a junk drawer, a junk closet, a junk garage, or basement that contains items that we all would categorize as you just never know. Like some of you are trying to figure out who's responsible for your paying monthly on a storage unit for some of this stuff, but I think it's amazing that There's just some stuff we just don't want to let go of. We've entitled this series, Burn the Ships, based on a story from the 1500s. On February 19, 1519, the Spanish explorer Hernan Cortes set sail from Mexico with an entourage of 11 ships, 13 horses, 110 sailors, and 553 soldiers. The indigenous population upon his arrival was approximately 5 million people. Now, from a purely mathematical standpoint, the odds were stacked against him by a ratio of about 7,500 to 1. Now, there were two previous expeditions that had failed to even establish a settlement in the New World. Yet, Cortez conquered much of the South American continent. What Cortez is reported to have done after landing is he actually issued an order that turned his mission into an all-or-nothing proposition. And here's what he told his soldiers. Burn the ships. Burn the ships. Which, if, if I'm one of his soldiers, I'm going, but, but, but Captain Cortez, can we talk about this for a minute? Because we might need those to get back home. But that was his point. As his crew watched their fleet of ships burn and sink, they came to terms with the fact that retreating was no longer an option. Now, I've read this story many times before, but I loved reading Mark Batterson's thoughts on it from his book, All In. He wrote this. He says, nine times out of 10, failure is resorting to plan B when plan A gets too risky, too costly, or too difficult. Isn't that true? Isn't that why most people are living their plan B? They didn't burn the ships. Plan A people don't have a plan B. It's plan A or bust. They would rather crash and burn going after their God-ordained dreams than succeed at something else. There are moments in life when we need to simply burn the ships to our past. And I think we do so by making a defining decision that will eliminate the possibility of sailing back to the old world that we left behind. So in this series, uh, we're going to look at ships that we need to burn to continue to grow closer to Christ. And the ship that we're going to look at this weekend is our old way of life. Ephesians 4 verse 17 says this. It says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do In the futility of their thinking, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you learned about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. 
to put off your old self. And then at one point, the Apostle Paul, he gets specific with what that looks like in verse 28. He says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. Dear thieves, <clears throat> yeah, stop stealing stuff, okay? Get your act together. But look at where he goes next. He doesn't just ask them to stop stealing. He goes on to say, but you must work. Doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Uh, thieves are crafty. I think we all know that. And Paul is going, hey, God can use that. I'm not just telling you to put off your old self. Allow me to introduce you to your new self. I'm not going to beat you up about your past. I'm going to show you how your future can be different. Do something useful with those hands so that you have something to bring to the table for everyone around you. Now, I don't know what you've done in your life up to this point that you may not be proud of, but I just want you to know there is a version of your life where you can do something useful and can add a lot of value to other people. You may not have had great parents, but you can be a great parent. You may not have experienced good leadership, but you can be a good leader. Uh, you may not have had a front row seat to a loving and godly marriage, but I just want you to know, you can have one of those. You can have a new life that is far better than your old life. The Apostle Paul, he wrote another letter to the church in Colossae where he encouraged the, their church with this. He says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. He's going, hey, I know you're you, but at the same time, you're no longer you. You're a new you in Christ. And then he says this, he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. I don't even know how to say that word. Covetousness. We should, get, we should put that word to death. Listen, which is idolatry put to death have a funeral for your earthly desires burn the ships and then Colossians 3 verse 7 says it says in these you two once walked when you were living in them but now you must put them all away anger wrath malice slander and obscene talk from your mouth do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Now, when you read through those lists, when you see all of the various things that Paul mentioned in this text, I want us all to ask a question this weekend. What part of your old life are you tempted to return to the most? What part of your old life are you tempted to return to the most? I'll go first. Mine is probably anger. Yeah, most days I just want to snap all the time. And I'm pretty triggered by people not doing their job well. I have this thing in me that believes whatever a person's job is, they should be phenomenal at it. Lawn care, your lawn should be crispy, okay? Car wash, don't miss a spot, okay? You want to know who I need prayer for the most? It's arrogant waiters and waitresses who feel like they don't need to write my order down, and they're just going to memorize it, and like, like, I have a complicated order, okay? And it's like, like, no, I got it, and I bet my wife every single time. I was like, I guarantee you they're going to miss something. It's like, Ryan, you need to chill out. You can remove your own pickles. Relax, okay? <laughs> Like, but, but when you look at the list, what's yours? What's the old self look like for you? And maybe, maybe just maybe, yours isn't on the list. When you start thinking about the ship you need to burn, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's peer pressure, work pressure, or my favorite neighbor pressure. When we're under pressure, it's amazing who or what we turn to. 
Paul gave us an idea of what we need to put to death in our old life. But then he gives us a picture of some things that we need to put on. And it says this in Colossians 3, verse 12. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. I feel like the Apostle Paul is meeting me at the restaurant and he wrote this entire scripture just for me, especially when I'm dealing with an I don't need to write down your order server. So he starts with compassionate hearts. Should probably wear that. It's a good idea. Kindness, fine. That's fine. We'll do that. Okay, you should be doing your job, but that's fine. I'm going to be kind today. Uh, humility, who am I to deserve elite customer service? I thought that was in your job description, but who, what do I know? Uh, meekness. Uh, I could work on more of that. Patience, I have zero. Uh, bearing with one another and forgiving. Listen, when they get the order wrong, I'm like, if you would have just wrote it down, you wouldn't have messed up. And it's like, no, I, I've got to put this stuff on every day. Every single day, because I don't naturally wake up with this stuff on. But it is amazing. Once I put it on, it's remarkable what can happen in my life. Because sometimes I look at the server that got my order wrong, and I say these words, do you have anything going on in your life that I can pray for? Do you have anything going on in your life that, that I can pray for? And then they'll tell me a stranger something that absolutely breaks my heart. And I think in that moment, I'm so glad I'm not the old me. I'm so glad that I didn't because who wants prayer from an angry person? Ah, we get my order wrong. Hey, can I pray for you? Like, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> so I, I think for you and I, we've, we've got to burn the ships. We, we've got to put off the old self and put on the new self. And so how, how do we do that together? I, I really think it comes down to, to one word. W one word that if you do it, it'll help you leave your old life behind. And that word is surrender. Surrender. I think you and I have to surrender our lives to Jesus and say, you're in charge and we're going to do things your way. And I don't always get what I want. I don't have a Burger King lifestyle of having it my way. I mean, here's what I know about you and me, whether you're a Christian or not. We all have a way. We all have a way. Away. I don't know if you've ever thought about where your way, your lifestyle, the way you govern your life. I don't know if you've ever thought about where it actually came from, but it comes from a, a myriad of, of variables. Upbringing, uh, growing up poor. One of my friends said he was so poor that they would go to Kentucky Fried Chicken to lick other people's fingers. <laughs> Some of you will get that in like a couple hours, but just... But it'll shape you when you're poor. You, it's amazing what'll happen. Uh, growing up middle class, not having too much, not having too little, that'll shape you. Growing up wealthy, having more than enough, yet observing how wealth can impact relationships can have an interesting effect on the way you see the world today. Uh, how we lived shapes our way, but also where we lived shapes our way. The burbs, the sticks, the base, the hood, the south, the north, the beach, the lake, the woods, all major variables on the makeup of who we are today. Birth order, only child, youngest, middle child, oldest, one of two, one of eight, favorite child, it all makes a difference. Growing up with two parents, experiencing your parents getting divorced, learning why they got divorced years later, all of that shapes us into adults who wake up one day with our very own way of doing just about everything. But here's what I find interesting. When Christianity first began to spread in the first century, they actually weren't called Christians. They were called followers of the way. Followers of the way. Stemming from the words Jesus spoke when he said, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. So at the very beginning of Christianity, you had a group of people who were bringing their old way of doing things and saying, let me bring that to the table together in a community and began to make a shift to subscribing to a new way, the way. And that's what I propose that we do today. I propose that you and I surrender our way. Uh Oh, one of my favorite Proverbs is, is this one. It's Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Submit to him and he will make your paths straight. I want you to consider that this weekend. How many decisions are you making right now where you are actually leaning on your own understanding. How many life decisions have you and I already made leaning on our own understanding? I can answer for me way too many. When it comes to decision making, the phrase I hear the most is, well, Ryan, the way I grew up, and I get it. And maybe you grew up in a, in a godly home like I did. Or maybe the way you grew up, it, it, was, it was abysmal. But however you landed at your way of doing your life, I believe that you and I should all submit our way to God. There's a story in the Gospel of Mark that I find very interesting, and, and, and it goes like this. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit Eternal life, which is a very, very good question. Jesus says, you know the commandments. You should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. This is a good kid. Like, I don't know that many people that have checked all these boxes. My kids don't even check all these boxes. The honor, honor your father and mother, they don't do that. So right away, I like this guy. I'm like, this dude's awesome, all right? So, so he, go, he goes, I've done this since I was a kid. But then Jesus looked at this really, really good kid. It says, it says he looked at him and he loved him. He says, one thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have. Give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come. Follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He went away sad because he had something that he wasn't holding. He had something that was holding on to him. Uh, This is a text that doesn't just have to deal with money and wealth. The bigger picture that I see here in this text is really dealing with lordship. Sometimes it's like we have no problem calling Jesus Lord until him actually being Lord forces us to make a decision to let go of something we'd rather hold on to. What this text shows me is that you can check all the Christian boxes and still try to be in charge of your own life and your own decisions. So you date how you want to date. You spend how you want to spend. You work how you want to work. You eat how you want to eat. You drink whatever you want to drink. You watch whatever you want to watch. You listen to whatever you want to listen to. You may go to church and be a good person, but at the end of the day, if you are honest, you're still in charge. And as long as you're in charge, you'll always have a ship to get on to go back to an old way of living. A question that I think that we have to answer this weekend is who's really in charge? I mean, who's really in charge? You may not be a super Christian, but if you're the one in charge of your life, then I think you're headed for super trouble. You may be a good person, but I just got to be honest with you. You're a terrible Lord, and so am I. If you surrender your life to Jesus, it means that. It means you and I surrender. It means we surrender the authority of our life to him. He's Lord 
not a consultant. He's Lord. He's, he's not an executive coach you just do a session with. No, he's Lord. He's in charge. And I realize that a lot of us are going, I mean, he's Lord, but, but Lord, can't you see who's coming to my house on Thursday? And, and, and I don't like my brother, and I don't like my sister, and I don't like my parents, and I don't like my in-laws. Do you like anybody? I mean, but on some level, it's like I've got these people coming over, and they're, they're passive aggressive, and they're never grateful, even on Thanksgiving when we all go around and are supposed to be grateful for stuff. Like, like Lord, what am I supposed to do with them? It's like, yeah, well, welcome them with open arms. It's like, well, why would I do that? I don't know. It just seems like a Jesus thing to do. You're like, but Ryan, they got baby mama drama, and they always bring that drama to my house, and they got an attitude, and they can't cook. They don't help clean. I mean, we could go down the list, and I would just tell you to serve them anyways. Why? Because you're not in charge. That's why. And I just... I think Jesus would serve the people who should have been serving him. Sorry, not I think. I know. That's a real thing. That happened. So I just have to wonder, this holiday season, what it would look like for you and me to put our ways on the table and say, Lord, here's my life. Here's my ways and here's my relationships here's my career, and here's my money, and here's my decisions. And just, I just can only imagine if you and I, this holiday season, fell to our knees before the chaos begins and just said, Lord, I know I've got some expectations and some things I'd like to go my way. But before I get cooking, and before I get clean, Lord, I just want to invite you to have your way in me. There is nothing more powerful that can happen in your soul than the moment you stand before God and you say, Lord, have your way in me. And you may be tempted to hold on to anger, or malice, or as the Apostle Paul put it, wrath. But I'm going to encourage us this weekend to let it go. Burn the ships. Now, I, I think this is the perfect time in your life to leave the old behind. There may be something in your life that is just hard to let go of. And I, I just want to share a final verse for us all to consider this weekend that I think is really going to help us. It's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. It says, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Not everything is beneficial. Believe you me. I do believe it's hard to make Jesus the Lord of your life overnight. I mean, I'm talking about where you have truly surrendered everything. I really do believe that's a journey for a lot of people. Just ask the rich young ruler. But I just have to wonder, if you and I began to look at all of the major components of our lives, and especially the things that we need to put off, or let go of that can be very, very difficult and not get into the weeds and get very legalistic of, of, of do's and don'ts and rules and commandments and just going, is this right or is this wrong? Because again, that's a fair debate. But I think a better question this week is, is it beneficial? Is it good for you? Is it adding value to your life? What's it? It is anything that would keep you from making Jesus Lord. And you could pray about what that is. 
It could be a relationship. It could be an app. It could be music. It could be a show. It could be alcohol. It could be a sport. It could be a career. I, I don't know what your it is. But if it isn't beneficial, if it isn't adding value to your life, if it isn't helping you grow, what good Lord, what good God would encourage you to hold on to? So I got to encourage you this weekend. Burn the ships. Burn the ship of substance abuse. Burn the ship of porn. Burn the ship of anger. Put a stake in the ground this weekend and say, I am moving forward and I am not going back. For some of us, that may mean getting accountability for an area you struggle with. I've learned that when you tell somebody what you want to let go of, they'll remind you, sometimes in, in an annoying fashion. But reaching out, talking to somebody and saying, hey, I'm leaving this behind. I'm, I'm, I'm burning the ship. We're, we're, not, we're not doing this anymore. That may mean ending a toxic relationship. It, it could even mean quitting a job. I know that's tough. But for some people, their career is costing them their peace and destroying their soul. My prayer for us this weekend is that we wouldn't have any available ship to return to our old life. Would you consider praying about that today? Would you consider praying about if there's anything in your life that you need to get rid of to truly surrender to God? Because you want to know what I, I find interesting is that I... I'm incredibly grateful for what we're doing right now. I'm grateful that we're able to gather all around the state of Minnesota and that we have technology that allows us to stream this gathering all over the world. And what makes me grateful is that the only reason we're able to do that is because over 2,000 years ago, a bunch of people like you and me came together and laid down their way to follow the way, a new way, a higher way, a better way to start the movement that you and I are taking part in right now. In these next few moments, at every location, we're going to sing a song. But before I do, I want to give each and every person an opportunity to surrender their life to Christ. Maybe for you, it's rededicating your life to Christ. But I've got a feeling that there's some people here today who need to make a decision, draw a line in the sand to leave their old life behind and truly make Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life. So for everyone who wants to make that decision today, I'm going to take a few moments right now and say a prayer for you. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we want you to be that. Today, we pause and say thank you for what your cross and your sacrifice has done for us. You paid a debt on our behalf for our mistakes and our sins and our wrongs and our past that we could never pay on our own. And so we receive that gift right now. We receive that gift of salvation. And Lord, we ask that you would be the Lord and Savior of our life. We surrender that to you. Lord, today we come before you and we say, have your way in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the very first time, uh, here's what I would encourage you to do. We've got uh, wonderful people in the, at Next Steps booths at every location. We've got prayer teams down at the front. We just encourage you to 
to tell somebody. I think that's a powerful next step for anybody beginning a, a journey or restarting a journey with God. And now at, at every location, we're getting ready to, to sing a song, and I, I want everybody to stay seated. I really want you to truly embrace the song and really consider what it means for you, because it's a song that's not easy to live. But my prayer is that as we sing it, it would start to become true. It's called, I Surrender All. And in these next few moments, for those of us whose Reality has been, I surrender some. I pray that we burn the ships today and truly surrender all to Jesus. So join us as we sing. who you are, we thank you for how you love us. Jesus, we're thankful that because of the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross, we don't have to carry the weight of this life alone. We don't have to carry the weight of our shame, our anxiety, our brokenness, whatever it may be. You tell us that we can give that to you, you will carry that for us. 
Lord, I just pray that you would remind us of that truth today. Would you remind us that the plans that you have for our lives are far greater than anything that we could ever imagine for ourselves. God, we thank you for who you are. We love you so much. We pray this all in your powerful name. Amen. Amen, everybody. It was so good to be with you today. If you need prayer for anything at all, the prayer team will be down front and would love to pray with you. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.